Reverse engineering time. This is the GPS GF07. It's a uh, tracking device. Uh, it allows you to put a uh, cell phone SIM card in and then you can uh, text it and it'll report back its position. Um, very inexpensive device available in AliExpress. Um, however, be aware that uh, this uses the uh, 2G network which in a great part of the world uh, has now been uh, long discontinued. Certainly where I live uh, the 2G networks have been off for a number of years so uh, of no use to me it won't work where I live. However, um, I think it'll be an interesting teardown. It was so inexpensive. Let's uh, see what they stuck in here. Okay, uh, a little battery in the unit um, and then the actual module. And then on the case, uh, there actually appears to be an antenna embedded inside the plastic here. Uh, and there's a small, um, there's a small uh, pogo pin that comes up to it. Looks like everything though is included inside this uh, module here with some small spatter smattering of uh, power supply components or something. So I've disassembled the uh, module. There was a carrier circuit board which has the SIM connector and a little pogo pin that connects up to that antenna. We have a little uh, metal RF shield and then the star of the show um, is another circuit board uh, produced by a company called Scherzing. Uh, they seem to specialize in uh, this kind of application. Looks like there's two chunks of semiconductors on this. Those will be very interesting to de-encapsulate. We'll do that and then a oscillator and then just a smattering of uh, discrete components. Uh, let's just zoom into this board here, read the part numbers that are on this. Uh, we'll take it apart and take a look at some uh, probably not super modern silicon given that this is a 2G application. Uh, however, um, this is a real testament to how inexpensive uh, GPS modules became uh, when they started out there multi tens of thousands of dollars and now um, I imagine what I'm holding in my uh, tweezers here uh, is manufactured for well less than a dollar. All right, uh, two chunks of silicon. Uh, the first one is known as an RDA8955L. It's a, a GSM quad band processor. Pretty easy to find a data sheet on the internet. Uh, this is the block diagram for, uh, for how to use it. Uh, it has uh, obviously interfaces for LCDs and keyboards, uh, which of course would be a typical cell phone. However, of course, in this product, uh, they're just using it as a uh, interface to the GSM cell phone network, um, so they didn't include that. Uh, the chip below uh, is a power amplifier, the RDA6625. Uh, it also has a data sheet you can easily find. Uh, of course, you need a few watts usually to reach out to, uh, to catch uh, a cell phone network, uh, so it makes sense that was probably a, bit, a different bit of silicon. Uh, what is interesting, of course, is there is actually no GPS uh, on any of these uh, bits of silicon. In uh, second generation uh, cell phone networks, uh, they use triangulation between the cell towers to determine position. So even though the module uh, was made, labeled GPS tracker, there is no GPS involved. I think they're using that word more as a generic uh, idea of uh, location. Um, let's uh, take these packages apart. Uh, this is black epoxy and if we dissolve it, uh, we can then see the actual silicon dye. Behold, a single chip cell phone design. A lot of technology went on the last 25 years to create this. Um, however, having said single chips, not quite. Uh, the reason I didn't clear off this uh, black goo sitting on the die, I wanted to point out that they actually glued uh, three dice together here. Uh, we of course here have most of the circuitry, but sitting on the top die there is a 32 megabit uh, SRAM. I don't see too much here because the metal is so heavy, but you can of course pick out uh, details like for example this is the power up here, pretty obviously. And I say that with confidence because you look at the size of those big fat traces there. And then the data bus is sitting uh, at the bottom of the device. And the other one is a 32 megabit uh, NOR flash. So basically this is the non-volatile uh, silicon that stores the program. Uh, this is the volatile storage for the processor. And then here's the main show. Looking at the, uh, on the uh, side here, left is the RS section. I can say that with confidence because whenever you see an inductor, you're looking at high frequency RF. Now, there's uh, two balance, uh, balanced, unbalanced transformers, one sitting here and one sitting here. You need a balance to interface to the antenna going out this way, um, which is a balanced connection uh, for signal integrity purposes. Now, you might of course though ask why are there are two. Uh, this chip supports two bands of operation, one at 900 megahertz and one at 1800 megahertz. And uh, these connections here actually carry on to the RF amplifier where there's a duality uh, in that die. 
So if you're wondering why there's two there. Now sitting just above and just below are a couple more uh, inductors and uh, these undoubtedly are the mixers. This is going to be a super heterodyne device. Uh, you have signals coming here in the digital section of course which is what you want to transmit the data but you want to upconvert it to that 900 or 1800 megahertz um, and to do that you do it and they call it a mixing uh, basically. We see an inductor like this sitting around. Um, it's good probability it's a mixer. There are mixers which don't use inductors but it seems to be pretty popular these days to do this particular topology. Uh, basically you multiply a high frequency by the signal you wish to send and that goes out and then coming back in it's the exact opposite. You uh, multiply it by that number of megahertz and you extract the, uh, the base band. Now uh, to create that very high frequency a voltage controlled oscillator is the most uh, traditional way of doing it. And here we see a classic thing called a folded transformer sitting here, uh, which is a strong sign that that's the voltage controlled oscillator. Um, and there we go. Those are the main building blocks basically of any sort of RF section. Um, a real testament to some technology that was really aggressively investigated in the late 90s, early 2000s. They wanted to move all this into a CMOS process. Um, and here we can see the RS section. The reason they want to do that is, of course, sitting in the middle of the chip here is the digital section of a device. Um, all modern cell phones need uh, some RAM, some ROM, and a pretty beefy processor to handle all the protocol. So that's what's sitting in the middle there. Now, if we zoom in, of course, it doesn't look very interesting because it looks like just a, an array of X and Ys. Um, that's because that's the power distribution network. Same thing, you can kind of got to strip off the um, um, top metal uh, to, to see more. On this side of the die um, are basically all the utility functions. Um, there is a, a thing like an LCD display, for example. They talk about a on a die voltage regulator um, sitting perhaps here. Um, and uh, again, you can sort of see about 25% uh, of the chip is dedicated towards uh, utility functions, 25% to the RF and in the middle a digital. Um, if you're what these green things are, this is the bond pads as the uh, the die was placed here. Uh, bond pads don't always have to be in the side and uh, edges of a die, they can actually be right in the middle here and they they popped over. Okay, let's take a look at these three pieces of silicon once we strip the metal off. If we draw our attention to the uh, right hand side we can uh, see the RF section. The coils will now, of course, vanish because they were stripped away. They were created out of metal. Um, but if we keep on zooming in, you can see there's actually uh, lots of open area. You can see there's, of course, transistors here and capacitors and transistors sitting here. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's a fairly open area. Um, I'm not sure if that's because they've got to isolate things due to the uh, high frequencies to create enough isolation. But... Um, almost looks like wasted space, but of course I'm sure it's very much not. Uh, coming on to the left hand side, you can really start to see that, of course, the vendor was buying uh, intellectual property. Every time you see a room like this, basically it's a function. And um, as I mentioned, there's an LCD driver here. Ooh, yeah, probably here. Yeah, I wouldn't be too surprised that's the LCD driver. Um, and another fairly intense digital function sitting right here. Um, perhaps a microcontroller of some, some sort. And um, up here, looking like potentially a voltage regulator coming to there. So um, all in all, a real testament to modern design. Here we are mixing up uh, low power uh, voltage regulators, super high frequency um, RF functions, and uh, really uh, decent uh, mid-range processor functions right in the middle. The uh, SRAM, I can strip it down. You can see there's there's gates here. There's not a lot of them uh, sitting up above here. You can see the standard row and column drivers otherwise sitting down. A fairly unusual looking RAM actually. I haven't seen one like this uh, for a while, but um, that's about four megabits of RAM. Um, and then of course here we can see finally the, the NOR flash. Um, when I said this was digital, it's a little unclear, but basically these are just rows and rows of gates for digital. The rest of the space is, is a lot of capacitors, um, basically to create that voltage boosting function that's needed to steer around a flash uh, semiconductor. Final one, um, more artistic than informational. You can see as you strip away the metal, um, it starts to want to lift off the chip. You can see obviously, though I didn't leave it into the uh, uh, acid long enough and uh, this metal is only slightly stripped. So.
The final thing to mention is just the antenna appears to be a, uh, a very small antenna, surprisingly. You can see a screwdriver trying to hold it down. It seems to be created of a flexible substance. Um, well, not flexible stuff. It's, it's capped on uh, with some metal. Um, I don't think there's anything unique here. It's just simply metal. I don't think there's any sort of semiconductor or anything sitting under there. It just um, wraps around the case. So there we have it. This is uh, basically uh, a... Um, GPS tracker, although it's not really GPS. Uh, it's interesting though, compared to say like the AirTag, which relies upon a cooperation of a bunch of cell phones to track a device. Um, this one's a little stronger in the sense that it's completely self-contained. Um, it doesn't sort of leave its signature away to sort of indicate that something's tracing. Uh, good if you're trying to keep some intellectual property uh, safe. Uh, maybe not so good for nefarious people who uh, want to put a track on something. But um, I think this would be a really strong uh, product if they, of course, would offer a 3G version or a 4G version. Because, of course, this uh, 2G module is now very much uh, heading into serious obsolescence. I hope you enjoyed that teardown. If you did, I would certainly appreciate a thumbs up. And we'll see you on the next one.